Boom, we are live. Hello, 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 everyone. Uh, a minute late to the Pete Show. First of all, welcome uh, for the third and final evening of the Scotch Moment Whiskey Society Masterclass uh, Week. It's been a lot of fun. I think tasting through whiskeys, first of all, is always fun. It's always fun to taste whiskey. Learning so much about whiskeys, I think, through these online tastings has been amazing. Um, and so, the time has finally come to cap off the week with, I think, a very important and exciting tasting session. No, not because I'm here doing this one. I'm a little biased, but as you can tell by the title, I'm sure you're already aware, this is about the smoker. Um, and I'm already seeing people, George, hello, 4 p.m. in Portland. Welcome, Larry Norris in the house. Thanks for joining, guys. Uh, it's gonna be fun, I, I mean, I think, Obviously, we'll be talking about peated whiskey. Uh, the goal is to obviously get into peat, talk about peat, but really, I think, talk about just the whiskeys beyond the peat. And so uh, it'll be fun. Now, just for a little context, I, I know it's in the caption below, but the whiskeys we'll be talking about today and, and tasting together were all released in the Scotch Hall Whiskey Society's wow. June outturn. And uh, you know, I, I know I know a lot of you are familiar with the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Obviously, if you're watching this, you're either subscribe or you're a member. Uh, we are essentially the leading whiskey club in the world, and we we bottle rare single cask, single malt whiskey uh, from not just Scotland but distilleries all around the world, and offer them exclusively to our members through either our online shop or through over the phone. So it's always fun tasting these whiskeys, and it's fun sharing these even online when we can't get together in person because. There are not many of them out there. I mean, and as we get into them, you'll see each bottle I have here is one of, you know, one of a couple hundred, maybe a little bit more at times. So I think it's always fun to, to share the tasting experience together. Um, and yeah, a, a bit about, you know, I think for today or tonight, depending on which time zone you're in, uh, I, I, like I mentioned, the, the theme is the smoker. The smoker was the name of the selection of four whiskeys that we had uh, on offer in our June out turn. And I know. So a lot of members went after all four and they ordered those together in a specially priced bundle. But I know a lot of members also just picked up one or two you know, of them. And so I guess as we go through this, I'll be guiding the, the tasting. We'll talk about the whiskeys. We'll talk about what ties them all together. It may not be as obvious as you think. Um, but then, you know, I think more importantly, it's, it's good to hear everybody's opinions, what, what you think. No two palettes are ever alike. So, you know, regardless of what I say, I'd love to, for you guys to chime in and share your thoughts as well. So let's drink whiskey. Hello all, welcome, let's, let's drink whiskey. Uh, unmistakable name, but haven't, couldn't help but notice you've been participating in every masterclass this week. So this is the third, I appreciate that. It's good to see a lot of members coming back and back. And you know, I think now the world is starting to open again. We're finally getting outside. Um, and just to answer that question, we, we do plan on continuing these throughout just, well, I guess indefinitely. So even after we resume our physical in-person tasting events, we'll be doing a lot of these live tastings. Cause it's just, it's be, been a fun way to, again, to connect, share the tasting experience together, uh, especially when it comes to whiskey that you usually cannot find or really cannot, do not have many others to share it with just by the nature of the single cask. There are so few bottles out there. Um, so let's do this. So today, I'll, I'll, I guess we'll, we'll kind of jump into it. And let me start by saying, obviously, the, the commonality amongst all four whiskeys here are is that they're peated. Peated meaning that they're smoky. Uh, we'll talk about peat. What else? Uh, I guess, if anything, you know, we'll, we'll talk about peat. We'll talk about the different types of peat. Uh, I don't know. I, I'll issue this challenge to you guys and, and maybe to myself, too. And I'll throw you in there because this is a master class. Uh, and I'm supposedly the master, although I don't think a master really exists in this, at least in this room. Uh, I think we're always learning. But uh, for today, I, I, I think I want to, I want to, we'll talk about peat. All four of these whiskeys are peated, yes. But I'd like to go beyond that. I, I think when it comes to peated whiskeys, it's easy to sort of characterize or profile a whiskey based on it, it the fact that it's peated and or it's, or it's smoky rather. And oftentimes we sort of neglect the many elements of the whiskey beyond just the peat. Um, and so what, what, I guess what I'm getting at is today, I, I, with each whiskey, I'll make this attempt and I'll challenge you guys to, to join me on this. 
I want to go beyond the peat. I want to go beyond the, the smoke and with each whiskey, sort of pick out the different elements that are unique. Um, that's something that's not always easy to do because sometimes when, it, when you're tasting peated whiskey, the smoke is often dominant. And it's some it's not always easy to sort of just go beyond that. But I think with a little bit of experience, if you've been drinking peated whiskey for a while, it might be easier for you. If not, I'll, I'll kind of help you find ways to unlock that and get beyond the peat. But I don't know, I, I think, my, I guess to sum it up, my opinion is that peated whiskey is often judged for just being peated. And there's you, so much more to, to the whiskeys than just the peat. So many elements, such as the wood, the, the barley, the grain, the spirit, everything from the, the brewing and, and, and distillation process that creates the whiskey. And so I don't know, I, I think, again, I, I, this is not, this is not a, I haven't done this with these whiskeys yet, but as, as we go in, I'll be sort of trying to shed light on, I, I don't know, the, the whiskey in its entirety. So what do you guys think? Any, anything, anything else you'd like to see with this special peated whiskey tasting? Uh, let me know. But George Kaplan, good to see you. George, uh, I appreciated your post on Instagram. George is here. We met down in Kansas. He's a member. And uh, yeah, you've been growing quite the collection of Society of Whiskeys lately. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, Matt is here. Matt, good to see you. Also in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, can't Sing, Can't Play. I like that name, but hey, everyone it says Can't Sing, Can't Play. And free Sipsy Russell, Sipsy Russell 2.0. Welcome back. Um, it's good to have you. He says, I did not get this bundle, but I am always eager to learn what they taste like. Yeah, I, I, I will say normally when we do these YouTube tastings, uh, especially when Jen and I do these together, when we will preview whiskeys before they're released to society members in the US, we make a point not to taste them in advance just because, I don't know, I think it's fun to have the spontaneous sort of impression, you know, right, at, right out there uh, front and center. With these, I did taste these, and you'll see the bottle. The fill level's pretty high. I have had, had a dram of each of them, um, mostly because I want, you know, we're talking about them a bit more in depth. I also wanted to see how they've evolved since the first pour to the second, or sometimes third. I think in this case, I've had a, a couple drams of each um, and jotted some notes just to, so I'm not a total, uh, total. Uh, so this is not total amateur hour. I want to keep some level of professionalism here. But that said, this is the Scotchman Whiskey Society and not your typical whiskey brand. So there really are no rules, I think, at the end. So um, whiskey and donuts is in the house. Good to see you, Johnny. Let's drink whiskey says, I agree, Ben. Just look at the difference between a lagavulin and, and a spring bank. Yes, in essence, two peated whiskeys, so much more than the peats. We'll talk about the peat, of course, um, but we'll, we'll go be, let's just go beyond that. And I, and I just want to encourage everybody, if you're watching this, Join me on that journey of, of uncovering all of the wonderful components of these whiskeys beyond just the peat. So Jesse Voisin's in the house. Good to see you, Jesse. Jesse, another uh, another Wichita, Kansas uh, meeting, as well as GCAP. So good to see you guys. Let's let's dive into it. So I I put the order below. I think when we when we offer the bundle at first in the June out turn, there was the order that may have been displayed is not necessarily the tasting order. So if you've already lined them up, um, just be mindful. Here's the order. And actually, you know what? It's I just updated the caption below. So we'll start with 66.163. That's the cast number uh, called a perfect finish to a perfect day. Kind of ironic because <laughs> this is the first one we're starting with. So we're starting off, I guess, uh, phase two of the day, which is after work, I think, for most of us, uh, unless you're on the West Coast. We'll start with a perfect finish. So just remember that. Uh, then we'll go to cast 93.122. Can I have them all lined up here? This is like a, a green bottle fest over here. We'll go to cast 93.122, Baldrick's Cosmic Tardis. And then we'll go to 16.43, Is again, as you see below, oddly satisfying. And then 53.316, Wood Shavings in Boatyard. I uh, love that name, by the way. Well, we'll, we'll let's, let's get back to that. So four peated whiskeys one hour or less now we're already 10 minutes in and this is fun I, I mean i don't know if you guys do this at home in terms of uh, tasting four pita whiskeys there was a time in my life i'll admit that that was a little intimidating for me uh it was just the idea it's, it was just sensory overload for for a few years here but now i think it's become easier for me at least to, to pick out uh, all the little nuances of, of these extremely boldly flavored whiskeys and uh, this will be fun. So what we have here is the first two, just to sort of get down to the society classification system and, and explain how that works. 
we have 12 different flavor profiles that we categorize all of our casks into. And the reason we do that is so if, if for members, if you want to order something, you, you may not be familiar with the distillery, but you want to explore something new, the flavor profiles help guide you towards the unique single cask whiskeys that fit your palate, regardless of where they came from. So I think it's a good way to open your mind and, and experience to, to new things. Um, when it comes to the peated whiskey, we actually have three flavor profiles. We have lightly peated, peated, and heavily peated. So, you know, the, the lines are, are sometimes blurred between these. It's, it's not always easy to classify them in any of the three, but we do have two lightly peated. We'll start with those. And then we have two just regular peated. And, you know, and some of those to some of you might be like really heavily peated and that's totally cool. Uh, the light ones might be too light for some of you. The light ones might be really smoky. So that's okay too. Um, no two palettes are alike. So anyway, let's uh, let's get into it. If you guys have questions along the way, again, I'd love to hear what you think. Share your thoughts on the whiskeys. Uh, and let's just start off. First of all, who has these in front of you? Do you have you guys poured these? Just comment below. Let me know what you guys have. It would just help me as we go in it and going along rather uh, to know if... Uh, who's kind of, who has what, if you will. So I'll start in the, in the meantime with cask 66.163, a perfect finish to a perfect day. And every time I try to do this bottle show and the LED light and everything is just watches it out, but there you go. I think that works sort, sort of blurry, but uh, yeah. As you can tell, these are the new society labels that came out actually just last month for the first time in the US. Um, so here we go, let's let's put those up. And you know what I'll do actually, just to make this easy for everybody following along, I'm gonna post the, let's post the name in the description. I'll post it here so you can see it as we're going. All right, boom, 66163. Now that is, what that means is that it's a 66 distillery that the Scotch Mall Whiskey Society has ever bottled a cask from, or, the, or rather the 66th distillery. Yeah, that's correct. Oh man, what a day. 66th distillery we've ever acquired a cask from. And the 0.163 suggests it's the 163rd cask we have bottled from that distillery. So if you guys are new to the society and the coding system, the next one would be 66.164 and 66.165. It just sort of goes chronologically in that sense. Um, and so, yeah, this is, let's start as you can see here, Highland whiskey, eight years old, second fill barrel, 59.3%, just to give some insight on what that means. Highland is the region of Scotland that this distillery is, is located. Highland region is the largest geographic region in Scotland based on footprint. Um, not the largest in terms of number of distilleries operating. That would actually be Speyside, which you could argue is within the Highlands, but a separate region nonetheless. And when it comes to Highland whiskey, we don't see a lot of peated whiskey from Highlands. Um, most of it is unpeated. And I guess before we get into that, or probably just to help, just to re really quick, what is peat? Um, by the way, feel free to build on this explanation if you'd like, but peat is essentially bricks of earth that you know, when it comes to making whiskey, we won't, we won't dive into the, the distillation process. This is more about tasting, but when it comes to making whiskey, you essentially start with grain. You need grain, water, and yeast, and wood, and thyme. But you start with the grain, you malt the grain. In this case, it's barley. Single malt whiskey is all 100% malted barley. You malt it, which means essentially just add some water. I'm simplifying here. Then you lay it out sort of on a, on a malting floor. And to, to dry the malted barley, you light a kiln. And the fire creates heat, which essentially dries it, uh, prepping it for the distillation process. But when you take these bricks of earth, all throughout Scotland called peat, and you throw them on the kiln, it creates smoke. And the smoke actually bonds to the drying grain itself. And that smoky flavor carries out into distillation. So it's different from say, you know, a, when you have a smoked cocktail, you go to a bar and you'll they'll take an old fashioned, and this is an example here, and they'll actually physically smoke it with like a smoking device with a hose and a thing that, I don't know, reminds me of like a early nineties laser tag type of a, setting, but if there are any laser tech fans out there, essentially you, they are infusing smoke into the spirit. This is actually taking smoke and bonding it at the, at the, at the grain level and then carrying that through to distillation. So 
that was a quick quick overview. Hope that makes sense. But I think that the key here as we get into these, they're all different. And when you cut the peats or rather bricks of earth from different places throughout Scotland, the actual geology can impact the flavor. You know, the, the peat that we'll be cutting from say the highlands, which is the mainland of Scotland, the, the, the elements within that are very different from say peat that you'll cut from the coast or the islands where you have more sort of a seaweed and brine and, and really sort of just oceanic influence within the peat itself that tends to carry forward with the whiskey. Not always, but, but usually so. Um, so we'll be dissecting, I think a few different types right here, but this is highland, so mainland peat. You don't see a lot of it. Uh, for me personally, it's becoming kind of a go-to, perhaps because Isla whiskey is just growing in popularity, maybe harder to get these days. Though well, we have some here we'll taste today and, and, and there's still out some out there, but I, I've been loving this. So eight years Highland from a second field bourbon barrel, uh, which means it was used to age bourbon, shipped over to Scotland. That barrel was then used to age Scotch whiskey that was dumped. And a second batch of spirit was put into that cask. And that's what this is. So this is second fill. Technically, you can say it's a third spirit to go into that cask, because if you include the bourbon before it, and then the first batch of scotch whiskey, and then this one, but we call it second fill coming from, from America, uh, from the bourbon distillery. So right away, kind of a light gold, more of like a uh, heavily oak Chardonnay for any uh, wine drinkers out there, but just in color. Color, I mean, it only tells us so much at times, or sometimes it tells us nothing at all, but I have to make the observation. So right away, what I also look for too, if you can see this, like, like all society whiskeys, this is uh, cast strength and non-chill filter. It's essentially dumped straight from the cask with just a, like a rough, fill. what we do with the society is we'll do a rough filter just to eliminate any sort of char and particles from the actual cask that are harmful if you consume. But um, you often will see some sort of fine sediment. And more importantly, this band of oil at the top is the natural oils, you know, sort of in, in fats from the oak itself, I don't know, which I think gives a lot of texture and oftentimes you know, the delivery of flavor is enhanced with that oil. So you can see that right here. So here we go, let's nose this. Um, I, you know, I, I apologize, I was looking at some of the comments here. I know, uh, Marco, you said earlier, my favorite bottle I had two years ago was 66.108 caramelized smokiness. Uh, yeah, I have that here somewhere. That was fantastic, another 66. Uh, Andrew Cox says, I had the oddly satisfying and it's awesome. We will be getting there as well. And I'm excited for that one. So if anyone's sipping on this one, let me know, but here we go. So right away, I'll share my thoughts on it at least. You know, it's interesting. We I, I talked earlier about the, the, let's try to go beyond the peat, but actually for me, the smoke on this one is, is pretty subtle. I get more of sort of like a vanilla cream and maybe sort of a citrus peel note first. That, that, that at least jumps out at me. It, it is more approachable. It's softer. Uh, it has this sort of highland malty and fruity and grassy note, to, sort of really kind of as an undertone to everything. And then on top of that, I get like a gentle plume of smoke. Like, like a sort of like a steam room. I, I, we were dude, we did a tasting not that long ago, an outturn preview tasting, and there was a there was a whiskey, and actually it was another sort of mainland. It was a space I paid whiskey. It reminds me of sort of just walking into a steam room. It's not sort of an offensive smoke or really robust smoke, but imagine so it just it's really thick and, and, and dense. This is really dense, but it's really subtle. Maybe a little bit of like salted butter. Oh man. I, I love the interplay on this one between the, again, the, the subtle smoke, but this sort of warm vanilla cream, bit of citrus, sort of like a, like a, maybe like a baked orchard fruit type of note. I love that profile. Really wholesome, really satisfying not overly aggressive and just, just, just solid, you know? Oh man. Oh man. John Wood says need a scotch called Ben's laser tag. Yeah, we, we could see that someday. I'll, I'll take inspiration from 
from you on that. Oh, man. Here we go. It's on pellet. What? what? Oh, it's, it's right here. 59.3% ABV is a natural gas drink. So I have my trusty water jug, as it's called, I think, jug or pitcher. However, my fellow Brits, not my fellow Brits, but my fellow colleagues who are Brits uh, would, would call it a pitcher or a jug. I think we would just call this a water. Uh, I actually don't know what we call this in America. Maybe, maybe jug is adequate. Oh, man. Well, cheers, everyone. Okay. <laughs> Note to self, when tasting, I <laughs> try not to talk in the first five seconds because the alcohol was sort of just, just has not yet subsided. Oh, everything. Okay. Everything I just said about that whiskey being light and approachable. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really bright, really punchy. You know, it's an aggressive spirit. Again, it's it's, it's pushing sixty percent, which is really strong, even for me who's who's does this essentially professionally, tasting gas drink whiskey. And it's really bright, really intense and aggressive, but the profile is smooth. Oh man! So. Peated whiskey, yes. Is the peat that prevalent? I guess it's there in the form of like, a, a, I'm getting a bit of a cold ash, which is a nice contrast between some of that sort of vanilla cream and the warmth that came from that. But I mean, I get white peppercorn, which usually that's a note you get from just the alcohol itself, not necessarily the peat smoke. Um, it's it's just for me, like for me, that's a, it's a very it's a very fine blanket of just this gentle smoke over, I think, what is a classic Highland profile, the vanilla, the cream, the citrus peel, um, a bit of salted butter and a bit of malt. Very nice. Oh, man. Jesse says, COVID-19 sucks with an X, but hey, it brought us these awesome SMWS masterclasses. Cheers, Jesse. Glad you're enjoying this. It's been fun. I mean, we, we do events in person, um, which is great. But of course, we, we can't be everywhere. And so this is a good opportunity to sort of share the experience with everyone across the country. Um, what do you guys think? Does anyone else have this one? A perfect finish to a perfect day. We're starting off with very gentle. Um, uh, again, I think a good start to this one as well. I'm going to add a little bit of water here. Let's just say, I probably just added it. Well, in terms of drops, I'm not sure how many, but just a small dash. And just stir this. Oh man, this changes the profile so much. Yeah, what? Now we're talking. So now, you know, it's funny. I, I, I picked up like this salted butter, but now I get a lot of sort of baked bread, salty butter on top of that. The smoke has dissipated even more. I mean, it was pretty pretty gentle to begin with, but now it has more of that warmth from the vanillas and salt. Like, like two amazing things to cook with, by the way, vanilla and salt, or I either bake with vanilla, but oh. you can sort of smell the cream or the creaminess of it. That's, that, oh, it's so good. Sorry, guys. This is, I know this is not like a, a preview tasting. I, I believe this, this, this bottle is actually all gone. So I'm not, I'm not trying to sell you on or anything. I'm just, man, that is such a good whiskey. Or so good. A perfect finish to, the, to a perfect day. And perfect start to a, a much needed end to the, the day, tasting four feet of whiskey. So Tom R's in the house. I'm not sipping anything now. I'm doing a five R bag shootout later tonight. Um, Tom R, I'm sure you can find it in you to pour yourself a whiskey while we're doing this anyway. Nothing wrong with warming up to the shootout with uh, with something else, you know, Peter or not. But what do you guys think? Any, any thoughts? And again, I, I know this one. I think I know I saw some comments that some of some of you have the other ones. We'll we'll carry on, but. That was uh, pretty solid. Again, going back to the original theme of let's try to push beyond the peat and just get 
into the whiskey and for all its glory. I think that that was an easier one to do. The peat was not that intense. It was not that dominant. Uh, I think beneath it, really what you have is just a really robust Highland spirit from a matured in a bourbon barrel, which gives you that nice sort of bourbon, bourbon undertone. But let's go on. So let me, let's pull this out and well, let me just address a comment real quick. Andrew Cox says, I really like the platform where you do tastings with whiskeys that have already been released so we can taste along with you and maybe pick up some new things. Yeah, cheers, Andrew. I mean, I mean that's that's exactly the point. I think of this when we released three different bundles. Bundles is, is our internal term for uh, just a collection, you know, grouped together and offered it as one. And yeah, so this is the third one we did. The theme of this one, of course, is Pete, but we had one, the first one we started with was called the Purist, which is really all single cask, no additional maturations, which funny enough, so is this one. But uh, oh, they were unpeated and more of sort of the, the classical style of scotch. Uh, then we had the Tastemaker yesterday, which is exploring more double cask maturation, some wine cask, rum cask, and the, the influence of those into flavor. Um, anyway, so we're trying to do this and, and we plan on continuing. So I appreciate the feedback. I'm going off into a, a bundle tangent here, but let me, uh, let me move on. And speaking of ta tangent, does anyone smell corks after they uncork them? I'm not really that guy, but I just found myself doing it. And let's see here. So next up is, I'm gonna put this up again. I think hopefully this helps you guys. All right, so cask 93.122. Aldrich's Cosmic Tardis, another lightly peated. I'm just gonna stop doing this with the fact that it, the camera can't seem to focus ever, but here's the bottle. Trust me, the label is green. There are some words and what's inside is probably pretty special. So 93122, this is a whiskey from the Campbelltown region of Scotland. Campbelltown, oh, that was good. Campbelltown is, Technically, uh, today, the, the smallest region by uh, um, in, in Scotland in terms of number of distilleries, it was once one of the most prominent. Uh, the American Prohibition era really wiped out uh, much of the, 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 the industry in Campbelltown, as well as that of all of the Irish whiskey. Different story, different day. Um, I had a chance to go to Campbelltown for the first time. You really have to go the distance to get out there. Uh, but it is a phenomenal place. It's so beautiful, right off the coast in Western Scotland. And only three distilleries exist there today. So process of elimination as to what this might be. But one of the most popular among society members now is that of Distillery 93. This is 93122, the 122nd cask from Distillery 93. Um, seen comments you, you know, earlier of, of uh, well, Matt just mentioned, I have the 93.106 red diesel. Love this bottle, might be a sin, but when I enjoy it with a cigar, it seems to cut the peats and reveal the crisper, fruity flavors. Uh, I don't think there's anything sinful about that, Matt, to be honest, I'm, I'm with you on that. And that's a phenomenal whiskey. I think uh, a lot of you know that I'm personally a fan of 93 and um, there was, I had a chance to do a cast pick last year for as a US exclusive, it was from 93. Um, and I can't give anything else away for this year, but there might be more coming. Anyway, so let's get into this one. 10 years old, Campbelltown first fill bourbon barrel. Um, so this is fresh off, uh, well, fresh off a boat from where I am, which is in America. So barrel was used to age bourbon, shipped over to Scotland, immediately filled with this spirit. 10 years later, this is what you get. So you can, you can expect a, a greater cask influence from this one. And does anyone have this one as well? You know, I know some of you do, but uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts as we go along, but 10 years old, lightly peated. And, okay. So <laughs> let me pull this up. Baldrick's Cosmic Tardic. Bal Baldrick, which is, I believe it's a BBC, British fictional character or TV show. Um, right away, a big smelly gateway to the dark side. We dare you to cross the threshold to this alternative, alternative, excuse me, and confusing universe. Go on, you know you want to. Okay, so I had to read that because this is the most bizarre aroma I have ever, well, maybe not ever, that's a, that's a big statement, but one of the most bizarre aromas I've ever picked up before. 
So it's like, for me, not what I was expecting. It's usually with Cameltown whiskey, you have a bit of that coastal influence, some of the salinity of the Atlantic Ocean, a bit of sort of iodine. This is like confectionery sugar and I don't know, like a raspberry tart. I mean, in, in sort of an industrial way, I'm thinking of like pop tarts with <laughs> that foil wrapper kind of thing. It's, it, it's a bizarre, bizarre thing going on here. Almost, dare I say, a bit of latex. I don't know. Help me out here if you guys had this one. But a, a bit of latex, perhaps, maybe some, a little bit of brine and seaweed, but but very, very subtle. It's really, really sweet in sort of that sugary style right on the nose. Oh, man. 58.4% ABV. I'm really getting into this glass. But, you know, at this strength, you don't really have to. You can kind of keep your distance, and it's just really just booming right here out of this, in this nosing glass. Vesper says, I'm sad I wasn't able to get this one. Would have gone well with another 93 that's Doctor Who themed. That's right, we did have that theme as well. Um, Les said, didn't pick up any of these either, but going to enjoy a 10.102 carousels and seashells. Love that name as well. That's a, that's a good pickup. And Jared says, blue cheese. If you're asking Jared if I'm getting blue cheese here, not so much. I, I mean, I'm a big fan of blue cheese. I'm more familiar with blue cheese and whatever the hell is going on in this glass. This is a wild, wild aroma. Daniel says, I remember the description on the website said something about dead mice. Um, you know, I haven't, having not smelled many dead mice in my day, I cannot confirm or deny if there are any dead mice going on right now, but it's just wild. And it really is on the sweeter side. All right, enough talking about it. Wow. That is so bizarre. And I mean that really in the best way possible. I mean, bizarre in, bizarre in the sense that I do appreciate whiskey that's different than other whiskeys. That is, that is just like, for me, there's a really tart sort of lemon rind. Well, tart, but also sour. I get like a, a lemon rind, a bit of baked bread that sort of comes through, the maltiness comes through. And then really just a, a gentle smoke, you know, if anything. Like, again, like the first one, categorized in our lightly peated profile, but it really is just a gentle peat smoke. The confectionery sugar and that to a raspberry tart note that it picks up is really, really dominant, I think, of this one. Campbelltown, known, I think, unanimously as the funkiest region in terms of the whiskey it produces. But this one is just different from any other I've had, from this distillery and really any other in Campbelltown. Oh, man. I, here's another one. A little bit of water I've added right away. And it just sort of balances things out. The, the tartness has subsided. The sugar is not as prevalent. It's a. It's not as you know. It's just just by nosing it, it's not as sweet. But now it's sort of a more gentle wave of, of I guess, more salinity is coming out. Um, the smoke is like steam. We talked about the last one was sort of being like steam for like a steam engine, not like the steam room for the gym, but like a true like train steam engine oh man back in my day we always smelled those steam engines all around all right cheers my pillow millennials i think a bit of water really really brings that one out it's still so bizarre and i'll st i'll stop going on about how bizarre it is but it's wildly unpredictable um I mean, I, I suspect this is one I need to sort of go <laughs> go off and, and continue enjoy. Obviously, there's some room to play with here. The fill level is right here. So I'll either be enjoying this during the re remainder of the lockdown, or if anyone's in Chicago, once things open up, you can come join me here in the second city. Um, that's wild, wild. Very different from the first one in probably every way possible. Uh, the, the smoky character, maybe even less than the first, 
Uh, not a lot of tar, not a lot of brine, a little bit maybe. Really confusing, to be honest. I, I'm just going to say it's confusing, and I mean that in a good way. I do enjoy totally unique whiskey. I think some one once in a while things coming around, I'm like, I just, that is just wild. And actually, you know what? To its credit, it says here on the label, we dare you to cross the threshold to this alternative and confusing universe. Go on, you know you want to. Well, I appreciate it. I'm not the only one that, you know, kind of confusing, but just wild, unpredictable, and I think that's what we come to love from Distiller 93. So, uh, Zach asks, does it smell like a purple dead mouse? Well, you know, I just, <laughs> the the dead animals, I didn't get a lot of the dead animals. I, I, I kind of know what those smell like at times. Um, so, uh, purple, not so much. Uh, but anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's a wild one. So, let's continue the beat journey uh, into this bizarre realm. What we have next is, I know that some of you commented that you have this one as well. This is going to be, and let me do the copy and paste of the description so you guys can follow along. Okay, copy and paste after two peated whiskeys, not as easy as you'd think. Here we go. Cast 16.43, oddly satisfying. This is another Highland whiskey, peated of course. First, as was the first one, cast 16.43 matured exclusively in a recharred hogshead. So what is a recharred hogshead? It's essentially a hogshead is by and large the most popular type of cask. In Scotland, it is, a hogshead is effectively, you know, and it, what distilleries will do is import bourbon barrels from Kentucky and other distilleries likely in America, and they'll break down those staves and generally about three bourbon barrels, the saves of three bourbon barrels will form one hogshead. Uh, it's a more efficient way of maturing. Obviously it's a more efficient use of wood. And I think the, the larger cast size reduces the influence that the wood will have on the spirit. And for malt whiskey, a very sweet and delicate style of a whiskey, um, the hogshead tends to be ideal. So by and large, most of casts in Scotland are hogsheads. And this is rechard, which means essentially what the distillery will do is they will strip down the inner linings of the cask, uh, get into the fresher wood beyond the wood that has sort of been, well, influencing whatever was in the, in the cask before it, bourbon or other scotch before it as well, and reinvigorating the sugars and inner linings by recharring um, to produce really a more active cask that will have a greater influence and produce more bolder flavors for whatever goes into it next, which is this. Oddly satisfying, 62.4%, um, a bit of a jump in ABV, not much, but um, let's see what we have here. Oh yeah, you can tell right away. Oh, that smells so good, that smells so good. Oh man, it's just, I'm like a full two feet away from it and I can just, it's just booming. All right, so right away, darker color. And you can just, I'm suspecting that is from the fact that it is a rechart cask, um, more active wood again, more more char influence, creating the darker flavor, excuse me, the darker color, but, oh man. So, you know, if you don't mind, share again, if you, if you have this one in front of you, oddly satisfying, love to hear your thoughts as well. This is so different. This is, okay. The first couple we we had sort of a light, peat sort of thing going on. This is now classified into the peated flavor profile, the, the true peated flavor profile. Uh, but right away, this to me is smoke. You know, I, I, we'll, we'll go beyond that, but just to stop right there, this is true smoke. And it's almost like an Amer it has like this American sort of profile. And when I say that, I mean sort of like a, I think a lot of American whiskeys that we have, which are sort of straight shooters, bold flavor, um, I get like a lot of hickory smoke. I'm thinking of like an American barbecue. Of course, it's from Scotland. It's from the Highland region of Scotland. It's certainly not American, but man, this is uh, so masculine and aggressive. And I get like a savory note. A lot, I mean, I mean a lot like beef jerky, like a, the teriyaki beef jerky, maybe a little mustard seed. And it's so, it's so savory too. Oh, I'm loving this. The goal of this tasting is not to express what I'd love over others are all very different, but and this is a, 
hitting all the right notes right now. This is like a butcher in the glass. Oh, man. Daniel says, this one's fantastic. I get a kind of a clean peat smell from it first. Yeah, I think it is, it is clean in the sense that it, it's not smoke infused with seaweed and brine that you get from sort of Isla and others. It's true, sit in a forest, light a fire, grill some meats, oh, maybe something you freshly uh, killed in a hunt. I don't know if there are any hunters out there. So a couple weird notes for me, it says let's drink whiskey beyond the smoke, opening a new bag of rubber bands. Ah, cold smoked salmon and a bit of Parmesan. So the rubber bands I get, I, I, personally, I get some of the rubber too. And whatever that white stuff coating the rubber is, throw that in there as well. <laughs> I think that's there. Cold smoked salmon. Yeah, I, I don't get the fish you notice much, but I, I mean, I get like a smoked meat type of thing. I mentioned jerky, but oh, smoked salmon sounds so good right now, to be honest. And behind that, a bit of ice cream. Interesting. I got 16 point, George says, I got 16.43, oddly satisfying, solely based on the release tasting reaction. Haven't opened my bottle yet though. Oh, okay. This is so meaty as Jenna says. Uh, in Andrew Cox volunteers, it reminds me of a Carolina barbecue with a little hint of cheesecake sweetness on the finish. You know, it's so funny because you guys probably experienced this when nosing or tasting, when just tasting whiskeys, you know, I had in my mind kind of what I share with you with that. That was my experience. But as I'm seeing some of these other tasting notes and I go to the glass, I picked it up too. And now I can't shake the cheesecake that I didn't even realize was there at first. That wasn't one of the notes that really jumped out at me. But I do get a little bit of that cheesecake. And now all of a sudden I'm craving smoked salmon and cheesecake because I'm also really hungry. And I'm having four whiskeys and gonna, that would really help. Here we go. Cheers. Oh, yeah, it's okay. Again, it's very masculine in construct. That's not to say it's better or worse, but it just sort of has what, what I would describe as a masculine palette. Um, Burnt wood, think of like burnt embers, burnt malts. It has sort of the cereal grain. Um, if you've visited a distillery in Scotland, you have a chance to eat barley. And if you see on the floor, I'd recommend. If you, if you haven't, I would I'd recommend going, going and just eating barley. It tastes like peated malt if you just eat it. Very brittle. Charred smoke, charred wood. It's a lot of charred wood. It's not, I think the first, the first couple were sort of, you imagine like smoke filling the air. This wafts or plumes of smoke. This is like charred wood for me. Bonfire in the forest. Um, there's a chef. I, I had a chance. I was down in South America last year, a couple of years ago, um, down in Patagonia. And there's a there's a famous uh, Patagonian chef named Francis Malman. He's from Argentina, the Argentina side of Patagonia, but he's become I think one of the most famous chefs in the world now. And he does this unique style of cooking where he embraces the char. Everything is charred, not overly cooked, but like he introduces char in everything. And this, I think, if anybody else, there are any foodies out there, Francis Smallman, this is his whiskey. There's a lot of char going on, but it doesn't overpower. It's just so present and I think delivered in such a tasteful way. Really, really, really special. And nine years old too, or nine years young, I would say. So much going on, very active wood. Um, let's go back to the comments here. So Daniel says dark fruits and coca and dark fruits and cola come through in the background. Um, interesting the cola note. Oh. oh man, I keep getting out of the meats. I'm getting like a smoke town. Oh, it's so good. Oddly satisfying is the name to me. Nothing odd about it. It's just satisfying. I mean, this is just, just such a, such a, I don't know, great summer sort of smoke out whiskey. 
there's a really, and Daniel says, there's a really nice minty freshness that comes out mid finish. Let me go back to tasting. I'm actually gonna add a little bit of water too and see how that changes profile. Beautiful type. Oh. Got a little bit of that mint too. There is an herbal note. It's it is sort of refreshing. Oh. So good. So oddly satisfying. Sixteen point four three from a rechart hogshead. Let's try this out again here. Another Highland whiskey, and another peat Highland whiskey. Not as common, but I think I've been enjoying a lot of those lately. So let's um. Shall we? Let's drink whiskey says this drinks way below the ABV. Yeah, I would say so too. 62.4% that was pretty approachable. Um, but I would say with a little, even with a little bit of water too, it's maybe not necessary. It changes the profile and I really enjoyed it with a little bit of water. But in terms of approachability, I think it's, it's, it's really good and neat. Dangerously smooth. Uh, let's drink whiskey says I smoke a lot of meats and it's like pe pecan. Um, it's smoky, but not bitter to me. And Daniel says, gorgeous. So glad I opened it tonight. I, I'm glad <laughs> I have it open here as well. There's so, there's so much going on here and, and not to take away from the first two. It's, I, I would, we'll, we'll do a little recap at the end, but I think it, to me, it serves a di different purpose for a different time, for a different day of the week, different time. Um, and I guess I, if there's any background noise, I apologize. I'm in the office and this is officially after hours. So there is a lot of uh, cleaning of going on right here. <laughs> Let's move on. Tamar, I won't hold the bottle up to the camera. Been about 10 minutes ago. Old habits are hard to break, he says. Um, yeah, they are. I just wanted to, sh I wanted to show that one off, you guys. 16.43, oddly satisfying. Let's move on here. So, fourth and final. Whiskey of the Peach Show is probably something, well, let's just say more familiar. When you think of Pete, what do you think of? Um, this is that. And it is cask 53.316, wood shavings in a boat yard. Tom R., this one's for you. I'll show this bottle again because why not? Um, 10 years, refill hog said 57.5%. What I didn't include the description that's also important to note is this is from the island of Isla. Isla, a region of Scotland that, well, I suppose it wasn't always this way, but nowadays is known for producing really the peated style. Uh, when we think of peat, we often think of Isla and it's nine distilleries there. Um, of course, now everyone's making peated whiskey and that's great. And, and even Isla didn't always, wasn't always really known for that, but today it is. And off in the island on the west coast of Scotland, you have generally with the peat, as we talked about earlier, more, more influence of the Atlantic Ocean, of the brine and the seaweed. That's what you come to expect. And let's see what's in this one. Tom R says, 53 was my gateway scotch into Isla. It is, if I'm not mistaken, probably the largest distillery on Isla by a country mile. The opportunity to taste it at pure cast strength is still relatively rare. So wood shavings in a boat yard. Jesse says, love the 53 bottles. Jesse, I, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I believe we, when you first had kind of our whiskeys, maybe it was a 53, a 53 that really kind of excited you. I was really into, there was one, I think it was a young gun. Again, if I remember, and it was really just, it spoke to, I think, both of us. But if I'm wrong on that, please correct me. But right away. This is, I think, a best friend and a worst enemy to a lot of whiskey lovers right now. This is classic Isla in a glass. Of course, it is Isla in my glass, but right away, fire and flame, a bit of smoked ham. You know, earlier I talked about sort of like a the last whiskey, there was a savory note. It was like a smoked jerky. This is pure ham, like breakfast ham to me. But then... You sort of get beyond the savory note and get beyond the peat, as we talked about earlier. Let's try to get beyond that. I do get a lot of vanilla bean. It's like a very raw vanilla. 
some charred, I mean, some charred wood, but not, not nearly as intense as the last one. But there is sort of a wood char there and a nice maltiness. Just the malt meat and the grain itself. Like you really pick up on that. It feels very sort of like a farmyard almost. Oh, man. Props to SMWS for using good corks that squeak when you pop the bottle. It's the little things. All right, I'll do one more for all you cork enthusiasts out there. Yeah, they are good. Um, if you're trying to un you know, pour yourself a dram when your significant other is home sleeping. I find that they're not necessarily the best late night uh, bottles to open for that reason. But yeah, for every other occasion, when you open it, you know you're opening whiskey because it is loud. So refill ex bourbon hog said, which is I think pretty common to cast type, meaning it's sort of a gentle, already reused cask, um, which gives way for the spirit, the peated spirit really the, the island, the essence of the island, it gives it room to sort of come forward and doesn't really overplay or, or dominate the spirit with, with just woody notes. So I mentioned there's some charred wood, but it's still very faint. This is more Atlantic Ocean, smack in the face type of whiskey. Oh man. And Brian says, my favorite distillery, especially society bottle is from the distillery. A lot of fans I know of the 53. All right, final one. Oh man. So that is what we'll get into this a classic, classic beaded island malt. It's got a bit of that sort of coastal farmyard. There, I, going back to this, I picked up on the nose. It's there's a farmyard element to it. It feels like you're just standing in the middle of a farm, a barley farm. You sort of have like the wind, the sort of the Atlantic Ocean, picking up sort of just some salinity, running through the air, hitting you with a little bit of like a cold sea breeze. I do. I pick up a little bit of a colder texture, and just the, the character overall just evokes sort of being outdoors off the ocean, which is very far from where I am in the Midwest here in Chicago. But it's nice to, it's nice to sort of just imagine being there in the midst of this uh, quarantine. But yeah. Smoke tan is still there. I, I get some of that, more salinity, more vanilla bean. Really kind of a continuation of, of what I picked up on the aroma. No real surprises there. And Daniel says, there's a sweetness to this their whiskey that reminds me of a fresh car paint. Soy gorse has it, has it in spades and I love it. Fresh car paint there. Yeah, I mean, and I love you guys are throwing this up. We have the dead mice, we have the car paints, we have everything today. Um, and it's all more than, more than just smoke. Vesper says, I'm getting a lot of vanilla beyond the typical peat notes on my 53.310, also at 10-year-old refill hockey. So similar cast type, same distillery. Wonder how much is distillery similarity and how much is because of similar cast. The, the cool thing about single cast whiskeys is no two are ever alike. Uh, they're always different. But, um, you know, this is, perhaps, perhaps there are. I mean, I think that sort of the coastal Atlantic Ocean influence is, is going to be consistent amongst them. Uh, but the, but again, I think the wood influences are always is different. But I, I think this is kind of has a, as a core distillery profile. Um, a little off topic, but does SMWS plan on doing a sherry bundled run? Excuse me, bundled. Okay, a sherry bundle run anytime soon. Um, to be honest, we, we're planning these really on the go. We're we're always changing our outturns right up until the moment they're released at times. So I can't speak to that just yet. Um, I think that we know sherry whiskeys, like Peter whiskeys are very popular among society members. So we're always trying to really get the whiskey that, that is, is of interest. Um, so we can't, we can't just say it just yet whether we're gonna do this, but uh, Andrew, I, I think we will definitely take that into consideration. Oh man. 
this is this is probably the most aggressive of all of all four. You know, I think if you're jumping into Peter Whiskey for the first time, probably want to maybe stay away from this one. Although I should say my first experience with Peter Whiskey was one just like this, and I actually hated it at the time. I, I it was way too extreme for me. It wasn't really what I was looking for. I was looking for something that could sort of just I don't know, rela be relaxing at the end of the day. And I tasted a whiskey like this, and I thought, oh my god! All of a sudden. It's like me and this other personality in the room. And it just threw me off at first. I was like, this is so intense that yeah, it wasn't the sort of whiskey to sort of just sit down and enjoy. It was like a whiskey to sort of just try to tame and grab a hold of. And I over time, I think my palates will evolve just by tasting more pita whiskeys. And now it's 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 so much, it is become sort of like a, a whiskey to sort of just be with and accentuate whatever is on my mind. And and that's sort of the evolution of Pete. So, um, life drink whiskey says, okay, whiskey friends got to run. Have a nice evening. Thank you for joining us again. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's been wonderful. Free Sipsy Russell, uh, having a little 53.298 Takajian tugboats, I believe is the name. I think there's, I have one somewhere in here, in my little, uh, 53 stash. And, uh, it's a phenomenal one as well. We, we've been very fortunate to have quite a few from distillery 53, similar to this one. And they're always among the most popular, I think, for our society members and, and really phenomenal. So that does it for the four. I'll, I, I always do this. I say that too early. I want to add a little bit of water. Let me just kind of share a thought here. If you guys have added water too, let me hear what you think. Oh, man. So good. It, it, being, I'll just, I'll just say this, and maybe you guys feel this. Well, like we're we're all together on the internet right now, but just being locked down, itching to go outside, feeling a little bummed that my trip to Scotland was canceled uh, from last month. I'm sure you can all relate. Travel is canceled. Can't go out, see a lot of people. It's really great. I'm really enjoying the opportunity to just have a whiskey that takes me to a place. In this case, it evokes sort of that west coast of Scotland. Or really anywhere it has sort of like a cold just atlantic ocean sea breeze note to it and it, all of a sudden i'm again i'm here on youtube i have this bright led light it's hard to really escape my current environment but if i just close my eyes it really takes me to that place and i think to be honest that's what got me into whiskey to begin with it's there's especially scotch whiskey there's really malt whiskey of all types there's so many different styles of scotch whiskey um, particularly single malt scotch whiskey. And it really just, it, there's, it has the power to transport you somewhere. Um, a lot of these, I think, did that. And, and let's just do a recap. So we started with, let me ditch this um, caption here. We started with 66.163, perfect finish to a perfect day, which I thought was a perfect start to uh, the end of the day, but um, really nice highland, bright, approachable, soft, um, so it's fruity, but a lot of vanilla and, and sort of cream notes to it. Very, very different. Little, 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 uh, little smoke. And where does that take me? I, I'm now calling myself out on this uh, evocation of, of time and place, but uh, I, I suppose from the, from the Highlands that maybe is not as trans does not transport like some of these others do, but just a phenomenal whiskey. Ninety three point one two two, Baldrus Cos Mutardus, the most bizarre whiskey I've had in the month of June. And as you can see behind me, I'm surrounded by bizarre whiskey. We, we pride ourselves on finding the unique. And uh, so that's saying a lot. Uh, Campbelltown whiskey, known to be funky. Does it remind me of Campbelltown? Not so much. It is its own thing, which I really appreciate. Uh, and then 16.43, had oddly satisfying. Recharge hogshead, really aggressive wood, a lot of char. That to me just made me feel like I'm just in the middle of the woods with a big bonfire, eating some jerky, camping trip, camping, call it camping whiskey. We'll just call it that. It's camping whiskey. And then, of course, 53.316 wood shavings in the boatyard. Just a cla classic, classic island of Isla transport you, transports you to, to somewhere else. And um, you may, perhaps you've, you've been to Isla. If you haven't been to Isla, I encourage you to go. It's one of those places that everybody talks about. But before I had gone, I saw pictures. I'm like, ah, it looks nice. When you get there, you realize it's just a different planet. 
Um, and, and some places, you, you know, are hard to describe in words and, and with, with imagery, you just have to be there. And it really takes you there, sort of, sort of the edge of the earth feeling. And I love that about this whiskey. So, um, well, cheers to that. Oh, so, good. so I suppose the next step is really to just blend them all together and <laughs> maybe I'll attempt that a little bit. Maybe I won't. But uh, I would encourage you guys to all have a little fun and try it yourself. But uh, Neo asks, what is the best whiskey from their membership deals? Neo, love the name, love the matrix. But I would just have to say um, there are a few. There are a few right now. If you're not a member of the society, you're interested in joining, you can you can order a one-year membership uh, or you can you can pair the membership with a, with a bottle or a tasting kits. The tasting kit's a great way to sample the whiskeys. And do I have it here? Actually, no, I just opened one, so for another tasting, but um, Daniel says, do it. I think that's that's a little bit of peer pressure. Don't mind that, Daniel. We'd love to have you, Neo, but you know, ultimately, I, you can pick one of the bottles, different pro profiles. It really depends on what you like. I think the idea with Society Whiskey is that no one is better than the other because I find when I taste whiskeys, I have my own preferences. I'll taste them and think, wow, this one is really the standout for me. And I'll talk to a member on the phone or, or online and, and I'll hear, no, the, the, the other one or one of the others that I sort of just uh, sort of put aside in favor of others. It turns out to be the favorite whiskey that someone's ever had in their life. We get that a lot. Is uh, a, lot, a lot of members or our first time members will say, I've never had a whiskey like this. It's the best of my life. Um, I think it's safe to say I once felt that and, and enough to I was really inspired to join the team and be here. So anyway, um, as Jesse says, yes, it depends on your favorite taste profile. They are all unicorns. Pick one, enjoy the ride. The big thing I would say too is just give us a call. Yeah, during business hours, our member services team is on hand to talk you through the selection. I don't know. We, we like to get to know what you like, what you don't like, and help make a pick like that because I think there's nothing, again, and I, and I say this obviously now I'm biased because I, I work with the company, but there's nothing better than finding a single cask whiskey. That's one of a couple hundred bottles maybe that is totally in tune with your palate. Like it, sometimes there's, a, there's some whiskeys you'll find and you think, wow, that was really made for me. And knowing that everything is subjective, as Vesperger said, taste is subjective, the quality of them are all superb. The idea is that yes, let's let's find whiskey that the highest quality, but really make, make way for the discovery process. And I think when you find something that you say, wow, that was just made for me, it's unlike any whiskey I've had before. Uh, that's just such a cool thing. Of course, the problem is then it's hard to ever replicate because no two casts are ever alike and everyone is so limited. Uh, but for me, I mean, I have a lot, I have a lot of bottles here, but other bottles that I have that are just, um, I try to make last as long, as long as possible. So I'll have some whiskeys that are really special and I'll have the last third still in the, in the bottle. I'm just holding onto it as much as I possibly can. Um, and I think that's good. Sometimes that's good instead of just buying a bunch of bottles of the same whiskey all the time. It's really embracing, you know, the one, the one uh, that exists or one that you can get your hands on because the others are really just all dried up. Anyway, uh, if you care to listen to more ramblings about whiskey and things like this, you can follow me on Instagram at Single Malt Alliance. Otherwise, thank you all for for joining and for tuning in. It's been a lot of fun this week uh, with Jenna, who started off on Tuesday, and then Zach yesterday. Appreciate you guys supporting as always. If you have questions, reach out to us. And, you know, we'll be back here on YouTube tomorrow with Jenna will be here interviewing the head distiller of the brand new Waterford Distillery in Waterford, Ireland. Um, I had a chance to go out there last year and I think Jenna was out there as well before. And it's just a fantastic place. We'll be talking about barley and terroir and really opening our eyes to whiskey making in 2020, which is just a revolutionary year. Uh, a horrible year in a lot of ways, but in terms of the whiskey world, there's so much going on. Um, it's just not all necessarily open to the public as yet. So anyway, enough of that. I'm going to go enjoy some whiskey. So, Sancho, everybody.